Uh, hello everyone, I am Sina Siddiq, an admin at Sudanese Research Foundation. Uh, it's our privilege and honor that uh, we have today um, Professor Irvin Nair, who's a Nobel laureate. We are very pleased that he accepted our, our uh, invitation in this webinar, which is the second uh, in a webinar series uh, organized in collaboration between Sudanese Researcher Foundation and Trend in Africa. So our aim is to build capacity for education and research in Sudan. Uh, so Professor Nair is working currently in Max Planck Institute uh, for bio uh, biophysical chemistry in Göttingen, and he got the Nobel Prize for Physiology in 1991 uh, due to his work in ion channel recordings. And he, dis um, he developed the patch clamp technique, which is now uh, used routinely. Uh, we have also in our panel today Dr. Abdurrahman Madani, who is a clinical pharmacist in UK, Dr. Nawar Allah, who is the founder of uh, this Sudanese Researcher Foundation, and uh, Musab, uh, who established this collaboration, and his lecturer in uh, Nilan University, and Dr. Yasir Yunus, uh, who is um, uh, a researcher in Novartis, uh, US. Uh, so please, uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Well, uh, welcome everybody. I'm glad to have uh, uh, listeners from many places. And I would like to tell you about what motivated me to do the research that we did. And this, of course, starts with how did I choose to become what I am now, namely a researcher in the field of bioelectricity, of biophysics. And this started already at high school when I've, I was interested in all kinds of technical things, um, particularly electricity, and when I found out that um, uh, indeed there is electricity in our body. So already as a high school student, I decided that I wanted to become a researcher in biophysics. So let me say a few words about the history of this phenomenon of um, uh, electricity, bioelectricity, electricity in our body. And this started 200 years ago with the famous Italian uh, scientists Luigi Galvani and Alessandra Volta, who, uh, Luigi Galvani, who discovered that uh, there is, that you can make a frog muscle twitch when you stimulate the nerve with an electric shock. So everybody was excited about this phenomenon of bioelectricity. And 100 years later, the Spanish neuroanatomist Ramon y Cajal uh, uh, showed us in his beautiful pictures that our brain is made up of a network, a fil very filigree network of um, structures, which we now call neurons. And now I think we should switch to my first slide. So I think I will share screen. Um, um, and show you the thing. Okay, so um, this is Luigi Galvani's apparatus uh, with which he did his experiments in stimulating frogs. Uh, now, this is one of the beautiful drawings of Ramon y Cajal. Um, uh, and now we know that our brain is made up out of 10 to the 12th neurons. Uh, and each of these neurons makes contact with other, uh, with thousands of other cells via synapses. Um, okay, so Ramon y Cajal um, studied uh, the nervous system with his microscope, and he already developed ideas on what the signal flow in the nervous system is. You can see all these little arrows here, which is what he thought, uh, uh, how information is transferred. You know? And uh, it's amazing that he was mostly right, although all his ideas are based on looking at a microscope um, uh, of uh, fixed tissue. Anyway, uh, around the same time, there was a, a physiologist in Berlin, Julius Bernstein, who built this apparatus with which he could measure the first signals uh, of the kind which we now call nerve impulse or action potentials, uh, little electrical uh, 
um, variations which last only for about a millisecond or two. And of course, now we know that this is an, the action potential, the nerve impulse, which uh, transfers information in the brain. He also formulated what's called his membrane theory, namely that the electrical signal uh, arises at the membrane, a skin which surrounds um, cells and electrically separates the inside from the outside. And his theory that, uh, that at this membrane, um, uh, uh, the signal is developed. Now, um, 50 years later, British researchers, Hodgkin Huxley, did experiments at the squid axon, uh, which is a very thick nerve fiber, uh, which the squid uses to uh, uh, send his uh, uh, escape reflex uh, to, the, uh, to the mantle. Hodgkin Huxley were able to record currents and to separate currents into those uh, um, um, uh, carried by potassium ions and other ones carried by sodium ions. And they could show that if a membrane has such kind of currents, then together with just ordinary cable theory uh, and with the um, uh, considering that uh, both inside and outside of this nerve membrane of this tube-like structure, uh, there is conductive material, you can uh, predict or can show that a wave of electricity travels along the axon. Okay, so um, that more or less set the theme to um, my own research. Uh, that's what I learned about when I was a high school student. And then later on, after having studied physics, uh, I was looking for a um, PhD project, which uh, exactly would uh, try to uh, go deeper into this phenomena of bioelectricity. And actually what you see here is a recording from my own uh, thesis uh, in the laboratory of Dieter Lux, my thesis advisor, which shows beautifully the concept of nerve excitability. Namely, what I did in this experiment is I um, penetrated um, uh, uh, neurons from snails, from garden snails with fine uh, uh, microelectrodes, uh, recorded the voltage inside versus outside, which is uh, at rest about minus 70 millivolts. But then when you uh, inject a current, which makes the inside of the uh, cell more positive, you see uh, that at the end of the stimulation, which is here, it decays back. But if you surpass a certain threshold, that's these electrically excitable current switch on, then you have this surge of inward current through sodium, uh, uh, carried by sodium, followed by uh, outward current carried by potassium. So at this time, one knew, one knew that the action potential is a consequence of the permeability changes in the nerve membrane. The big question at the time was, what is the mechanism of these permeability changes? What happens when suddenly uh, uh, sodium ions uh, enter inside the um, uh, a nerve? Now, um, one of the idea was that there might be what Hodgkin and Huxley already alluded to, uh, so-called ion channels, little pores in the membrane which open and close to let uh, sodium ions in, potassium ions out. But there were alternative ideas. And so my friend, Bart Sackmann and myself, we decided that we want to prove that there is ion channels um, by showing that uh, one can see discrete step-like changes in current when these channels open and close. Now the problem was from some other considerations uh, we knew that um, if there are channels, we might expect current steps in the range of about one picoamp. Now, one picoamp is a very, very small current. Uh, to illustrate what one picoamp is, I drew here this arrow, uh, which is supposed to represent the quantity current uh, on a logarithmic scale. And you see 
There is one ampere is about the current which flows in the light bulb. Uh, one thousandth of that, a milliampere, is typically a current which you find in electronic circuits. All this is quit. Exxon, the structure on which Hodgkin and Huxley worked, has currents in that magnitude. But ordinary currents in biological tissue are much smaller, uh, again, thousandfold smaller on the microamp range. Um, uh, we now know that these currents, here you see currents elicited by the nerve uh, when it signals to the muscle that it should contract, that these are made up uh, of so-called miniature currents, which again are thousandfold smaller in the nanoamp range, and a picoamp, the range of single channels uh, currents, as to be expected, is again thousandfold smaller. The problem was that all methods available were um, limited in their resolution. They had an intrinsic noise of a few tenths of a nanoamp, hundredfold more than uh, 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 the currents we wanted to measure. So we knew we had to come up with a completely new method. And the idea was what now is known the Petchland technique, namely uh, that we placed uh, small glass pipettes filled with liquid onto the surface of a cell, uh, not penetrating into it, what used to be the classical technique, but placing it on, onto the cell, hoping that one could isolate a small patch of membrane, which then, when we were lucky, contained a channel through which ions flow. Um, and of course, if we apply a voltage across this membrane, measure currents, have a, a sensitive amplifier, we were expecting that we might be able to see, um, one second, uh, uh, to see these um, uh, um, uh, discrete changes. So we started our experiments on the muscle membrane, on the neuromuscular junction, on the place, not where electrically excitable channels are, but where you have channels which open in response to the neuromuscular transmitter uh, acetylcholine. And these were the very first recordings when we um, uh, succeeded in showing step-like changes in current when we had uh, a pipette which contained very small amounts of this uh, substance, acetylcholine, which was supposed to open acetylcholine-operated channels. Okay, so, um, Around the same time, a few years later, we were able to improve the method substantially uh, to see really clear uh, ups and downs when channels open and close. And also biochemistry advanced to the point that biochemists were able to isolate membrane proteins called acetylcholine receptors, which they could show if binding sites for uh, acetylcholine, the neuromuscular transmitter, and obviously, uh, what happens is that these membrane proteins undergo a conformational change, opening a passageway for ions when acetylcholine binds to this um, uh, 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 to these receptors. Now, with these improved techniques, we could come back to the original question, namely, what is the basis of the nerve excitability? And here is an experiment which a postdoc in my lab, Frederick Sigworth, did uh, again applying a patch pipette onto a patch of, uh, uh, now this is was a muscle membrane, which was also known to have these voltage operated channels. He depolarized the uh, membrane, as has been done uh, on the squid axon by Hodgkin Huxley, and he saw that in response to this depolarization, he could see little blips of currents happening randomly shortly after the depolarization. And um, when taking the so-called ensemble average, averaging many of these traces, he could show that there are these transient invert currents, which are exactly like those which Hodgkin Huxley recorded from the squid giant axon. So with these two types of experiments, um, the as the, as the choline, um, 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 uh, uh, operated channels 
and demonstration of step-like changes in voltage-operated channels, uh, we obtained the proof that actually these forms of electrical uh, um, membrane excitability are mediated by ion channels. Now, maybe we can make a small break here. Um, um, if there are questions, um, so um, can I go back to to um, um, no? So screen share. Yeah, uh, maybe you can see me now. Are there questions or should I just go on with the presentation? Uh, please continue, Professor. Okay, so I go again to uh, application window uh, and share. Okay, so you see the slides again? Yes, yes. Professor. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, these experiments proved the channel concept. And this was around 1991, 1992, uh, excuse me, 1980, 1980, 82. Now, what, what followed was a large number of surprises. I mean, when we started our experiments, we thought that uh, bioelectricity, electrical phenomena are restricted to cell types which were known to be electrically excitable, which is nerve, muscle, and maybe a few types of neuroendocrine cells. But what happened, it, what turned out is that once this very highly sensitive technique was available, people used it all over the world and found that uh, uh, ion channels fulfill a large group of different tasks in many different cell types. I listed here just a few of them. Of course, nerve cells, cardiac cells, but also in blood cells, in kidney cells, in liver cells, wherever there is um, a sensory transduction, wherever there is a physical quantity like light to be transduced into electrical signal in the nerve, there are special ion channels at work which respond here in the retina to light or in the inner ear to slight vibrations of the um, 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 basilar membrane uh, in the inner ear. Even in plant cells are a multitude of different types of ion channels which control the fluid transport in the plant cells, which controls the opening and closing of the stomata on the underside of the leaf. Um, and while well, uh, even in bone cells, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, are um, ion channels which uh, produce calcium signals and uh, regulate bone growth. Okay, so um, just one example of how many different types of channels are involved in uh, one basic task. If you take the heart, of course, it contracts, it generates a rhythm, and in order to do so, it produces an action potential, an electric impulse very similar like that in the nerve, except that it has a long shoulder um, in order for the heart to give it enough time to contract, you know. And of course, this action potential, this contraction is different in the ventricles uh, from that in the atrium you know, because uh, the two structures have uh, 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 different tasks. And here you see a, a number of different types of channels which contribute to shaping and controlling this action potential. And there is a set of channels which are very prominent in the ventricle, another set of channels which are prominent and contribute current, which is shown here as ups and downs, uh, to shape the atrial um, action potential. Okay, I'll come back to that in a minute when I talk about the next thing, namely the action of drugs. Okay, 
So, um, yeah, that was the next surprise, namely that ion channels are targets for pharmaca, for drugs. Now, um, what you see here is the effect of so-called calcium antagonists, uh, a, a, a class of substances which was well known before the uh, uh, development of the pestilent technique, empirically as drugs which are prescribed in hypertension, you know, and uh, for, for other cardiac um, uh, uh, problems. Now, calcium antagonists were then tested. Here is a slide from my uh, colleague in Bern, Harald Reuter, who uh, studied cardiomyocytes, cells isolated from heart, and uh, he was lucky that a few times he had on the patch pipette, actually on the patch, actually a single one of a special type of channels that one can find in these uh, cardiac cells, namely a, ch a channel which opens and closes in response to voltage, like the sodium channel in nerve membrane, however, which is permeable to calcium ions, letting calcium ions flow in for the heart muscle to contract. Now, this is what he saw when he did the experiment under control conditions, namely when he depolarized the membrane under control conditions. So he saw this flickering of up and down, very rapid succession of openings. If he did the same experiment under the influence of one of these calcium antagonists, trendipine, uh, the openings were much rarer and on average the current was much smaller leading to less contraction of the heart and also to less contraction of the uh, blood vessels because it is known that this same type of channels is also found in the, um, um, uh, in the cells lining blood vessels. Okay, so, um, yeah, well, these are just, uh, uh, it was just one example of how channels can act, um, uh, how drugs can act on channels. Let me uh, give uh, two more examples, namely one is memantine, a drug which is prescribed by doctors to ameliorate the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And it was found that it's a blocker of a certain type of glutamate channels in the brain, namely NMDA type channels. And um, uh, as the developers of this drug uh, assured me that patch clamp studies were essential for characterizing the drug's action and for getting it uh, registered and approved as a drug for human use. Another um, uh, uh, drug is uh, Calideco, an FDA approved drug for cystic fibrosis. And um, uh, this is a so-called genotype-specific uh, drug for personalized medicine in the, in the, in the, in the sense that it ha uh, acts only on people who have, um, have the disease, but uh, special types of mutations. And this brings, brings me, takes me to the next uh, chapter, the next issue, namely that um, defects in ion channels cause diseases. Uh, first of all, arrhythmias in the heart and other cardiac uh, conditions are very often due to uh, changes in uh, ion channels. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, muscle uh, diseases, epilepsies, type 2 diabetes, uh, cystic fibrosis, myasthenia gravis, all are examples um, of um, diseases which at, at the basis of which are defects, mutations in ion channels. And this is only a few examples out of a huge list of um, uh, uh, diseases, mainly very rare ones. But this is not surprising since we now know that about 200 of our 30,000 genes code for ion channels. And of course, there can be mutations in um, uh, all of these. Okay. So uh, that brings me back to uh, cardiology and 
the so-called channelopathies, the diseases caused by ion channels. Um, I discussed above already that uh, to shape the, the action potential of the heart, there are many uh, channels participating. And one example of a car uh, 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 um, cardiology problem is the so-called long QT syndrome, which causes a number of complications uh, in the heartbeat. And this is caused by a lengthening of this plateau phase of the action potential. And now, if you consider what may happen, what may uh, be the basis of a lengthening of this um, a plateau phase, um, you um, uh, um, um, have, to, uh, have to consider that the um, 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 uh, return phase is more or less determined by a balance of inward currents, which keeps the membrane depolarized, and um, outward currents, which drive the potential back to baseline. And you can obtain a shift in the length of the, of the uh, action potential, basically by two ways, either by a gain of function in a sodium channel, uh, in an inward channel, um, namely by delayed inactivation, or you can get the same phenomena by a loss of function in the uh, potassium channel drive, which drives the membrane potential back. So, of course, for the doctor and for the treatment of the disease, it is very important whether a given person has a problem with the sodium channel or a problem with the potassium channel. Now, there are uh, different forms of long QTS and um, uh, eight of the 12 known forms are linked to ion channels. Uh, this is also why um, the uh, 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 FDA, the American Food and Drug Administration, um, uh, developed rulings for drug safety uh, tests and ruled a long time ago that all candidate drug, drugs, all molecules which are in the development to be used uh, as drugs have to be tested um, against possible side effects in one of these channels in the heart which is particularly prone to cause arrhythmias, you know. And in fact, this has been going on, this, this, this drug testing uh, with the uh, petroleum technique. And now a new initiative has been, has been um, started called CIPA, which um, uh, prepares protocols for more extensive testing of drugs um, uh, for their influence on, on uh, uh, cardiomyocytes. And this extends to five different types of channels. You know? because any uh, action, side action on one of these channels may lead to complications uh, in human use. Okay, so these are examples um, of uh, involvement of channels in drug action and uh, the general problem of channel pathies, diseases. But now let me close with a somewhat surprising and funny role of ion channels, namely the sensation of heat and cold. You probably know from your physiology textbooks that uh, the skin, the human skin, contains many, many different types of little organized, organized sensory organs for touch, pain, uh, heat, particularly also for um, uh, for the temperature sensation, you know? And um, uh, we now know that there are specialized ion channels um, which are localized in the nerve endings, you know, and uh, they open uh, and close in a temperature dependent fashion. Uh, there are several types with these funny names, trip A1, trip M8, these are all different channels and here is indicated in what temperature range a given channel opens and closes. So trip A1 is open mainly in the very cold and closes 
when uh, it approach, uh, 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 temperature approaches 15 to 20 uh, uh, degrees. On the other hand, there is this channel trip V1 and trip V2, which open only in uh, 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 above uh, body temperature, heat and in noxious heat. You know? Now, <clears throat> together, these channels um, cover the whole range of temperature, which we can feel. You know? Now, this surprising uh, uh, came up when researchers found out that these channels open not only to temperature in response to temperature, but are also sensitive towards certain substances in the sense that in the presence of these substances, uh, a channel opens at a given temperature where it usually would not open, you know. And if you look what these uh, substances are, uh, it becomes immediately apparent why you feel hot when you eat pepper, because it happens that trip V1 and trip V2 are sensitive towards capsaicin, the ingredients of the hot pepper. Whereas on the other side, uh, menth menthol, the ingredient in mint, uh, influences the opening of the cold sensing channels. So in your next meal, when you feel either hot or cold, you know uh, uh, what this is due to. Okay, so this brings me to the end. And of course, I shouldn't, um, I shouldn't uh, stop without mentioning two things. First of all, all the second half, uh, the description of findings with drugs, with diseases and so on, is not our own work, it's work of hundreds of colleagues throughout the world, but using our techniques. And of course the original uh, development of the technique was done together with Bert Sackmann, with whom I share the Nobel Prize, and a number of postdocs at the time in our lab, Fred Sigworth, who is now a professor at Yale, Alain Marti, who is a professor at, uh, at Paris, and Owen Hamill, who is at the University of Texas in Galveston. So, thank you for your attention.